Welcome to Introduction to Philosophy. This is my first actual uh, video on this. This is my first actual installment of this course. This is one of my um, intensive courses. This is the first one I'm really starting. This is the first one I'm actually doing since I announced it a couple a couple months ago. Um, so I, I I guess I'm kind of still on the fence about whether I'm going to do notes, like I write down notes, or, or like type notes and have them ready and that's still something up for discussion that I, I'm not sure if I want to do that or not so if you would rather me have that along with this it's like it's like a companion to this I think that would, if you think that that would be a good idea then put and tell me that below and I will do that um, but this is um, I want I'm going to talk about a little bit about, about what about what philosophy is in this and I'm going to do to discuss various different Philosophers, which were before which were before Socrates, um, these are the pre-Socratics. So this is the way I'm going to start this this course off. And again, like I said in, 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 in a, another video, I'm going to be, be using this book. This is the, called the Great Conversation by Norman by Norman Melchert. Um, this is the book that I that was used that I that I read and was used to teach me philosophy, like seven years ago. So. Um, I purchased this, and I thought I thought I thought it would be would be great for this for this course. Um, so, pretty much this the way it talks about the pre-Socratics, it has um, a lot of stuff that it has a lot of um, actual writing, actual like epithets that are from the pre-Socratics, um, and pretty much there are a lot of thinkers I want I want to discuss here. So. Um, and I'm going to try and do it in the, in the most, um, most, um, I guess the most, uh, detailed way as possible because this is a course which I'm kind of gearing towards those who want to learn about philosophy as to what it is. So, to have a, have a little preface as to what philosophy is, I would say that philosophy is the thought either as a companion to or outside of science. And as you know, science is just um, the way to experiment and hypothesize about about actual things about the world and make and do experiments and stuff like physics, chemistry, uh, biology, geology, and all those different scientific fields do 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 experiments and try to learn more things about the world that we live in here. And philosophy is kind of just a a group of people who are speculating about. The, what about what the world is made of? What does it mean to be good, or a uh, moral human being? Um, what is it? What what is the mind? Is it two things or is it one? Talking about us, the soul. Talking about justice. Talking about what it means to know something, or how can we know something? That's another you know I guess good way to good way to look at it. Is that those are just a lot, of, there's a lot of different speculation in different ways and different topics as to you know things about about this world. Except there, most philosophers, especially you know, um, you know, I, I guess most all philosophers throughout history, they all have kind of been in a spot where they can't really, unlike science, where in science you can't test what your hypothesis is. If you're like Thales, who I'm going to get to here in a second, you're saying that everything is water to a, to, 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 a, to a certain extent. You can't really test for that, so it's kind of a, a total speculative, speculative kind of thing. So, I guess before Thales, before these pre-Socratics, we had Hesiod and we had Homer. Hesiod was a poet who wrote odes. And he wrote a lot of different things. And I haven't read a whole lot of Hesiod, but I have read Homer. Um, Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, Homer is, Homer's stories, you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey are a lot about wars. It, there, It's about a war between the Athenians and the Spartans. And there's a lot of talk about people who are fighting in it, demigods, such as Achilles, where a demigod is um, somebody who is half human and half a god and has more power than, say, a regular human would, and talking about the gods themselves and how the, and how the gods are very involved in what the humans are doing. 
So, the in a way, the writings of Hesiod and Homer, pre, you know, who which came before and during the time of Thales and Anaximander, they almost were a precedent to philosophy itself in that they in that their writings were thinking about the world itself and talking about the world itself, talking about the gods and all these different things. And that kind of led to philosophy itself, wherein, uh, wherein instead of, you know, where, where they were just kind of writing about it, that the, their writings brought on actual speculation by the first philosopher, the, the founder of philosophy, or the first, the first philosopher that we know of, and these 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 pre-Socratic philosophers are are people that we don't know so much about. Really, they we have a, a somewhat of a foggy picture of who they were um, and what their philosophies were. I mean, we have a, I guess we have a better picture of who they were than we do their their philosophy because their their philosophy is a little bit difficult. And I kind of, I'm almost feeling a little bit weird starting this course off with pre-socratics in that because the, 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 the pre-socratics are very i mean if you have a, if you have a sort of a, a explanation like you do in this book there's it's not going to be as hard but it's it's kind of difficult to get a hold on these people and as to what they were th they were thinking and that's number one because the language and as to way that you were going to um, exchange thoughts was not entirely formed yet so the language that they had to to exchange their thoughts or to write their thoughts down wasn't entirely systematic and wasn't entirely formed and wasn't entirely like the way English is today or German but um, so that that's in one way is gonna make the epithets that we have of them today difficult for us to understand, and there are people still speculating today as to what these thinkers were thinking actually, as, and as there are many interpretations and thinkers and speculators as to what they were actually thinking, and as to what their epithets mean. And a epithet is pretty much just a little saying. All we have of these people is little, like little sayings, and uh, so that's kind of another thing that makes it difficult because we don't have that much. So first we're going to start with Thales. Thales was from Miletus, which was um, kind of on the kind of by in uh, kind of by Asia Minor, Asia Minor, which is like today's land of Turkey. Um, Thales was the founder was the, was according to Aristotle the founder of philosophy, and his thought was that. The cause and element of everything is water, um, and he's very. I guess the way I'm seeing it is he's very causal. His philosophy is very causal about water. Um, that water, everything is made of water, and also of gods. Gods are in things, but everything is of water. And as to how things came to be, that's because of water. Water is not a contingent, but a necessary thing. And that's one thing I want to discuss here as to what it, that's the to do to the difference between a necessary and a contingent thing. Now, if you you're new to philosophy, that's kind of a difficult distinction to to get your head around. But um, let's say that you're a Christian or a Muslim or whatever, and you believe in a God. You yourself. You didn't create yourself. You are a being as to your body and your mind as to how it came to be and as to how it is today is dependent on something else. And, you know, everybody who ha everybody who believes in some, in some sort of supreme, su supreme deity believes themselves to be a contingent being. I believe myself to be a contingent being. I don't manage my own um as to how i'm as to how i'm living today as to how as to how i came to be i didn't cause that that was caused by something outside of myself so as to how you are and as to as, and as to how you got here if you didn't 
cause that, then you are a, then you are a contingent being. And if you're like a if you're like a, an, an atheist, then there is no necessary being. And a necessary being is like Aristotle's or Dick or Descartes' unmoved mover. And we, we will get to Aristotle and we will get to to Descartes. And an unmoved mover is like a god or um, a spirit, which or a infinite thing, not not really necessarily a god, as we'll get to, but a necessary being is one who is responsible for its own existence and, and is responsible for its own being there. Um, even though, even though, um, even though re religious people aren't going to necessarily say that. The God caused himself because, that that a God causes himself to to exist because that that doesn't make sense. So so they say so they say the God never had a never had a beginning and always was, which also doesn't make sense. So it's difficult to um, sort of f figure that out. But that's kind of what the whole thing is. A necessary being is something that is a unmoved mover and is. And its cause of its own existence and being is itself. So, like the Christian God, for instance, that is a is a is a necessary being, and that it, then that he caused all being outside of himself and himself too. He, there is nothing in the earth or in the universe that is that is that is necessary. Just him, and everything else is contingent. So, that's enough for that. Um, right now because if you take a philosophy of religion course you will talk more about that but Thales says that water is a necessary being it's a cause and element of everything and all things are filled with God so there's a, those, are the, those are two main things of him um, and Basically, that's a kind of like a animism, but it's kind of different from a animism. And a animism is the thought that things are filled with spirits, and that spirits um, live in things and live among things. And you know, and sometimes we have to be in tune with those with those spirits. According to Thales, water occurs naturally, and there's this kind of like a nature philosophy that. A lot of nature philosophy and pre-Socratics tries to account for, say, a lightning is striking or a thunder or whatever, something something in nature. Some a lot of the times outside of the outside of this world as to how that as to how that happens. Um, however, Thales is not really about that. Um, water occurs not naturally, but he he says that water is a necessary being, but this is a sort of a nature philosophy that but it really isn't and what i mean by nature philosophy nature philosophy is kind of a pre-socratic sort of thing where you know um we we account for the, the things that happen in nature most of them by things that are outside this world say say say, say the gods um all things are filled with gods but the whole thing is that this world He's, he doesn't believe in trans and trans in being transcendental to to this world. What I mean by transcendental is this world only. We look to this world to explain this world. We don't look to other worlds to 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 explain this world. And the gods are also a part of this world. Um, so he says, account for the things you can see and touch in terms of what you can see and touch. He also says, water is necessary, not conditioned, um, and it's almost like the gods you know it's a kind of almost a way of thinking about that and this is what you would call these days you would call it a monism and a way of things outside of this world to explain this world so Thales that's kind of something that's a little bit, a little bit difficult to get because it's not even clear among it, all philosophers what he's saying but that's the general thesis of, of Thales so Let's move on to Anaximander. Anaximander has his own necessary being to, uh, to, to, to account for things. So he, he brings up this 
philosophical regress of the cause of things. Given the state, given the state, the state, the state of things X, it had a beginning. So the, given the state, given which kind of what, 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 what we would call the state, the, a, a state of affairs, a situation of things. Um, and as to that's basically what that is in in metaphysics, a, a state of a state of affairs is that there are a couple of objects engaged in some certain action. That's a state of affairs, briefly, and not in any not in any difficult, unclear way. Um, so, given a, given a, a state of things X, it had to have had a beginning. So, to to, to explain X's beginning, we we presuppose a prior state of things W, and W also had to have had a, also had to have had a beginning. So, to we explain W's being by a state of things V. So. This goes back and back and back and back. It's a causal chain, which we cannot really explain as to how things got here. So there's a lot of in in, in many in many pre pre socratics it's really about explaining the cause of all things, and it's talking about causation a lot, and as to how things got to, to be the way they are today. So we have v, and we must have a beginning for 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 for, for v. So we pre so we presuppose u. So we have to have a beginning for each thing, and as to how it got there, we cannot have this freestanding state of affairs, which is just there, and there's no explanation for it. It's almost like the principle of sufficient reason, but that that's a different different thing. So to stop this this causal re regress, Anaximander talks about the infinite or the boundless, which is a necessary state of things. Well. X, W, and V, and all the other states are contingent. The boundless is a necessary st state of things. It's a state of things which is the reason for the maintenance and the in the beginning and the existence of any other state following it. And an X matter says that this is a chaotic mixture of the beginning of all things. Now he talks about we have a few different things, hot, cold, and dry and wet. And we can't have wet if we have dry, we can't have dry if we can't have wet, and we can't have hot if we have cold, and vice versa. But in this case it's a chaotic mixture of all things. And that's how and that's to and that that's as to what the boundless is. And he talks about this as a chaos, a, a chaotic mixture. Where he gives the Example: If we have a circular pan with with water in it, and we put various different kinds of minerals in it with, of different weights, like like limestone or marble or whatever. If we kind of move it around, the heavier parts are going to move towards the towards the center, and the lighter stuff is gonna go off to the side. That's almost like a big bang sort of thing. Um. So that's kind of is his way, is his weird little way of solving that chaos. So an examander kind of takes, you know, Thales' idea of a necessary being and has his own has his own way of doing it. So moving on to Xenophanes. Xenophanes is a is a pretty interesting one, I think. Um, Xenophanes looks at the way that Hesiod and Homer portray the gods. Um, Xenophanes looks at how uh, he looks at how Thales portrays the gods and how Hesiod and Homer portray, portray the gods. Homer and Hesiod um, portray the gods as being a part of their world and being the same as us, but just more more powerful. Um, and this is against the, the 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 tradition of looking at the gods, you know, the way everybody has. But he says it's wrong for Homer to portray the gods as better than humans, as or as 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 no better than humans. Excuse me. Um, it's wrong for him to look at the gods that way, um, because according to him, there's the gods are a an infinite, the gods are an infinity 
level higher than us, and the way that they work are in ways that we can't even fathom. And the gods, according to Xenophanes, are almost like the way a Muslim or a Christian would look at would look at the god at would look at God today as a um, as a omniscient. I'm the I'm the benevolent and all powerful and um, pretty much entirely entirely transcendental sort of thing, which is beyond us. Um, so he's kind of pick, picking at that um, as to how that's kind of wrong. And Xenophanes is one who is uh, is like a lot of the nature philosophers who try to account for natural for natural expl explanation. Um, nature, nature philosophy is a kind of philosophy among the pre-Socratics which, which tries to account for um, as to how things occur. Some of them do it by talking about just this life, just among this life. Then Thales would do that. Xenophanes would not. Xenophanes would try to account for nature and as to how the way things will, as to how the way things are, as beyond this this whole life. So that kind of brings up up the little issue of how do we have knowledge of the gods then if they are so much higher and better than us? How can we know of them and perceive them? And that brings up the concept of epistemology. What is epistemology, you might ask? Epistemology is a branch of philosophy. It's a whole branch of philosophy which is, you know, has exploded um, since the late 19th century. Um, I mean, we, we've have the, every single philosopher usually does have his own epistemology, as does as does the, as does De, De, Descartes, Locke, Hume, Berkeley, um, you know, um, Schopenhauer, Hegel, and all of those philosophers have one. But with with Russell and Frege, and the explosion of the analytic kind of kind of philosophy, epistemology exploded, and there was this whole big um, look at that, and I'm going. I'm doing a course called Introductory Epistemology, so I will be looking at some of those things um, in more in depth in that in that course. So, um, and and I'll probably have an advanced epistemology course following that one. Um, but so that kind of with with uh, with uh, Xenophanes, we kind of have this little issue as to how can we have knowledge of, 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 of the gods then? And also if you take a, if you take a philosophy of religion course, you will also um, have a big you know uh, talk about religious epistemology and as to how you can have knowledge of, of the gods. Assuming that that, 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 that the gods are not of the, of, the, of the pantheistic fashion. And as Many of the Greeks before before Xenophanes and during during Xenophanes' time were a lot of where they were polytheistic and they were almost what 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 uh, what, uh, we, what what we what we what we would call today to be to be pantheistic, and a pantheistic god is is a, is a god that is not is it's either not not all good or it, it, it's either not 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 omniscient or not on the. Um, not omniscient or not omnip omnipotent so there it's kind of having a having a pantheistic god is kind of giving up one of those things but if you're not if you're not a pantheistic uh thinker then you have to account as to how you have to how we can know of this god now we're going to go to a big one and i'm sorry i'm skipping pythagoras here pythagoras is more of a mathematical thinker but we're going to skip pythagoras but we're going to go now to Her Heraclitus, which is a big one. Heraclitus is a big thinker. And then we have Parmenides and Zeno, and then we should be done. <laughs> um, Heraclitus um, is similar to Thales in that he ha he believes in the oneness of things. However, he, he goes by it in a very different way. One epithet of his is that all things come into being through through opposition and are all in flux like a, like a river. So he believes that things that things that things come into being and things occur by opposition and, and conflict and force. 
and he kind of says how, and he, and it's kind of like how um, this book gives the example as to how when you're playing a guitar, you put tension and conflict upon those strings as to as to, as to make a noise. <coughs> Another epithet of of Heraclitus is that you can't step twice into the same river. That's a epithet which is what Plato is kind of ascribing to Heraclitus. And it's not saying that you can't can't step into the in, into the same river. Is that you can step into the same river. However, every time you step into it, it's going to be different. So Heraclitus plays upon the idea of opposition and conflict and change, but it's all still one. There's all still a oneness here. Um, and there's a lot of opposition, opposition and conflict among that oneness. And he says that um, fire, he, he also looks at the idea of fire. Um, and not fire like how Thales looks looks at um, water as the element as the necessary element of the, of the world. Um, he looks at fire in a very different way, and it's and it's kind of difficult for us for anybody to understand what he means by fire. So I'm going to try and sort of explain that here. Fire is not like a element as like Thales water. It's fire as in a sort of world order, or as a immortal and a divine world, world, world order. So it's fire and fire, and, fire and logos. Those are his main two things. I'm going to get to, to logos here in a second. <coughs> but with fire, to explain fire is to think about the world having a certain order, a certain pattern of things, and that kind of brings us to logos. Logos is means to to speak or to say. It means discourse. It means a message. But what that really means for for Heraclitus is that there in the world there is a typical pattern or st structure as to how the, as to how things are, and there's a good word for that, and that's logic. Logic is the is the the word for that, um, and that, what what that means is that you can't say it is Tuesday and it is not Tuesday. At this, you know, you can't say that and, and be right or be understood because that is a contradictory re remark. So, logos is logic, in that it is a typical pattern or structure or, or, or order, and fire ties in ties in with that with, with that whole thing. So, there's logos and logos. Is almost like um, it's almost like an X of Andrews boundless in that it's the way that all things come into being. So that's kind of, I mean, I guess that's kind of a difficult thing to 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 to, th to think about. But I kind of want to think about that a little bit more in a different video because that's kind of interesting as to how we have this oneness of the world. And yet we have fire and logos, which ties together, which 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 accounts for the structure of all things, and the pattern and order, and it also accounts for opposition and conflict and a, and a, this whole one ordered thing of that is that that is that that is this world, and he also does 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 talk about what it means to be good and what the good actually is, and how the good it does play into this whole chaotic yet ordered sort of thing. So Her Heraclitus is very, very interesting, I think. Moving on, we have Parmenides. Now, if you, Plato's dialogue, Parmenides is a great this world. And he also does, does, does talk about what it means to be good and what the good actually is and how the good it does play into this whole chaotic yet ordered sort of thing. So, Her Heraclitus is very, very interesting, I think. Moving on, we have Parmenides. Now, if you, Plato's dialogue, Parmenides, is a great dialogue to read because it can go, it can, you know, make you really think as to whether things really are one or many. Par Parmenides argued that there, is, that there is no many, but there is just one. Everything is one together. There is no many of things. There is just one. Everything is one together. 
<clears throat> and if you read Plato's dialogue, Parmenides, you will pretty much read a lot about that, and you will get you'll be brought to to think about that. That is a great dialogue. Just if you if you just want to read something, you know, that is philosophical yet entertaining. So, Parmenides, given that we he 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 talks about the one. There's this issue of the the, of the riddle of, of Plato's Plato's beard, then that is the 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 nothing. I've I've I've, I've t talked about that here before. <clears throat> There's being what is and being what is not, and you cannot think of the nothing because that is a contradictory thing. And um, the atomists kind of take a different take a different take on that. Um, but there's that issue there and as to how we can as to how we look at being versus non-being and all that stuff there's a lot of little riddles and issues issues and all that and i'm going to be very short with with parmenides because i think that um it's better to it's better to understand parmenides um by reading that whole dialogue um and also you know the little the little the little um, parts of his book that we have. He wrote a whole book, and we have some of that. I think. I think maybe maybe we have. Um, we have we have we have a lot of it. Just not just not not all. Um, and then he was a he was himself a rationalist. He he lived, he believed that we should follow reason alone and not really try to go beyond that and that is that is why he is the first rationalist and rationalists of the modern period are people like uh descartes leibniz and uh um Malbranche. so um that's i guess the only part that i really want to discuss about parmenides there um and i think i should probably i think what I'm going to do is when I talk about Plato following this video, um, I will t I will have a video just for talking about that whole dialogue um, and kind of bring it into, into 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 perspective a little bit. And that whole dialogue is just about Par Par Parmenides arguing with Plato on or arguing with with Socrates on the on the forms. And the forms is a very interesting little philosophy which we will, which we will definitely get to. Um, and then finally, Zeno and his paradoxes. Zeno is a very another very interesting, interesting philosopher. And um, Parmenides had the idea of the of a argument, and the and an argument as to how you um, state your point as or state your thoughts on or, or to you know argue something as to um, is to have is to have a strength of rhetoric and the sophists. Um, don't the, the 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 sophists don't play in the game of of learning things and trying to know more things, but they they play in the game of rhetoric, which is learning to be most most persuasive and the most um, the most um, persuasive and getting getting in, and winning arguments and such. Now Zeno, it's very important to think about Zeno in terms of what a argument and what a valid argument is. Zeno was a pupil of Parmenides, and he had the, he had he had a paradox of common sense, and he he thinks about common sense and as to what the faults with it with it are, um, and he kind of brings up a few different examples, and shows how to think of things in a common in a common sensical way can lead you to logical contradictions and he given the let, let's get, let's get the uh, example of Achilles and the and, and the tortoise um, the we have the Achilles and the tortoise are in, are, are in a race and the tortoise is that is, is that point a ahead of Achilles so his Achilles's goal is to catch up to this tortoise but you would think that's a pretty much pretty pretty 
a pretty commonsensical thing to catch up with a different rotor. But it doesn't it doesn't work because by the time Achilles gets to here, the, the, the tortoise is at point B, and further and further it goes. And it so happens that <laughs> it's difficult to even think anymore that 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 that, that one runner can catch up with uh, with another. Um, he he looks at paradoxes of change and as to how and as to sh he shows how there can be paradoxes of common sense via via how things change in, in the world. <clears throat> and there's the midpoint paradox, which I, that's kind of what I'm calling it. Um, let's say I'm I'm sitting right here and I'm going to go to this door over here, as you can see it. Um, I'm going to go out. There's a set, there's a distance between myself and this door, and to get to the door, I have to go in the midpoint between here and the door, and to get to the door, I have to go the, into the midpoint between there and the door, and there's another 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 midpoint, so it seems like to to go from here to to the door is a non common it's it's a it's a nonsense goal contradictory thing because it seems like you can't really get to the door because you have to go to there and then to here and then to here and it gets very very much much smaller but you never actually re reach the door so that's another paradox of his and I'm gonna bring up another 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 paradox which I which I read a long a long time ago which is called the Sorites paradox let's say I have a bean and I put and I put the bean down. And I have this huge, huge, huge bag of beans next to me. Put I put another one down. Another one. And for a while, I just had like a few, a few, a few beans here. Um, and then I put another one, another one, and so on and so on. What point is it to when I just have a, a couple, a couple, a couple of beans to when I have a, t a lot of beans here? So there's like, there's. Where does it? Where is the line to, to, to between having a lot of beans and having only a few? Or where is the line? Where's the where's the line between having a ton of beans and only some? That's a very choppy way of saying it because there's better ways of saying that little paradox. But that's you know the way I want to explain it right now. And he Zeno works among the the argument which is called the reductio ad absurdum which is a valid argument and i have a lot of have a lot of have a lot of logic videos if you want to learn what the what the reductio is you can go there um but the, the but the reductio ad absurdum is the is arguing towards a a contradiction so let's say if today is um, let me get a good, good example. I can't think of a really, really, really good, really good example, but the whole thing is, is that you are arguing towards, to a contradiction to infer something. And I should come up, come up with a better way of looking at that. Um, it's, it's, you, it's, <laughs> let me kind of get it in the, in the whole, in the whole logical way. If you're doing a proof, if you have F and you have not F under the same, uh, under the same proof, then you can infer anything you want because you have argued towards a, a contradiction. And the midpoint paradox in the, in the, in the, you know, one of the, Achilles and the, and the tortoise kind of all do that. Um, so Zeno is kind of all about his little, his little paradoxes of common sense and showing, showing how it's flawed. And finally, I want to just have a little, little small note about the atomists, which were Dem Democritus and Lucifus. The atomists took, took um, Par 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 Parmenides' idea of the one and basically took, looked at everything as how everything is one and yet and yet and yet everything is still many. How, however, 
everything is 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 united together. However, everything is one via there being atoms, and not just atoms of stuff or of substance, but atoms of everything, and how everything is divided into atoms, and yet how everything is still united into this one thing, and that's kind of interesting. He, and they discuss. Um, the world, the soul, and everything about that, and, and how that whole, and how that, and how that, how the whole thing breaks down to there being atoms among the world, and, and how the world is based upon atoms, and how, and how everything is one, and yet still many. Um, and the, and D Democritus kind of solves the little non-being issue, where Parmenides just has being and non-being. Democritus has there's being, and among and among being, there's a there's a thing, which is a body, and there's a non-thing, which is which is void, and then there's no, and then there's also non-being out there too. So we can have this little issue, which is sort of a little bit more reconciled. So um, I hope this has been somewhat of a uh, competent, or I guess sort of okay, look at the pre-Socratics. Um, if you have any questions, or if you want me to, or if you want me to talk some, if you want me to do a separate video on one thing to make it to make it more clear, I will gladly gladly do that. Just just comment below and tell me, and I will do that. Um, so, I thank you for for watching, and I'll be back with an, with with another installment in this course on Plato. Well, I'll have I'll have, I'll have a few on Plato. Thank you.